Hi, my name is Jeannie Farrington, and I'm from San Jose, California in the United States. My first exposure to HPT was when I met Daryl Sink, more or less by accident. My cousin happened to be working for him, doing some clerical work, and recommended me to do some proofreading and editing for a course that Daryl was working on. And then Daryl had the need to have someone rewrite a book and sent me over to Hewlett Packard to talk to some fellows who needed a book rewritten. And so I did that. And Daryl liked my work and he said, you know what, I could teach you instructional design. Uh, it's harder to teach somebody to write. But you come with writing skills, so let me teach you instructional design. And I thought, well, fair enough. I like working with this fellow. Not sure what instructional design is, but it has to do with learning and education, and I'm very interested in that. And so I went ahead and worked for Daryl, and I noticed right away that nearly everyone in the field had either a master's degree or a doctorate. And I thought, well, I'd better go back to school. And so I started to take courses. And uh, pretty soon, taking a course at night, one semester, two the next semester, and so forth, I managed to put together a master's degree from San Jose State, which was conveniently located in my hometown, and which at the time was a very good school for learning to do instructional design. This was 25 years ago or so, a little more, actually. And uh, since that time, I had the chance to work with some wonderful people in the field because they started out with Daryl who was friends with Harold Stolovich and Erica Keeps and Tiagi. We worked with all of those people. I started coming to ISPI conferences right away. I met Jim Russell who had written one of the textbooks that we were using in school so I had long conversations with him. He talked to me about my career. It's that whole thing about when you come to ISPI and some of the people who are luminaries will just sit down and talk to you. You're nobody, you just showed up. And then you have friends and mentors and so those were some of my, my early mentors and then I, after my master's degree I I went and worked in Fortune 500 high-tech companies in San Jose's and Silicon Valley. That seemed the logical thing to do. And I had the opportunity there to go back to school to get my doctorate in educational psychology and technology from USC, where I met Dick Clark, who has been a big influence on my life. And I learned to think about what we accept as evidence for what is true a little bit differently in the doctoral program than I had thought previously. Um, it's easier, I think, when you're in a, vo a more vocational program, like a master's degree, to think of what you're doing. You know, you, you read something in an article and you say, okay, I'm going to try this. And maybe not question as much the source, where it's from, where these ideas came from, if they have reliability and validity. But once you go through a doctoral program, does something to your brain and you start looking for a ser more serious source of evidence. And so Dick Clark had a big influence on me in terms of that. And one of the questions that we used to banter back and forth is, what will we accept as evidence that something is true? A very important question, which kind of rules the world in a lot of ways. People get into wars about how they will decide what they will accept as evidence that something is true or not. So anyway, my 30-second elevator speech on HPT, or what I do, when someone asks me, I usually say something very short, like, I work on strategic projects for training and performance improvement with all different kinds of organizations. I work in a, cons in a small consulting firm. It's mostly me. Sometimes I use associates if I need to put together special teams for special projects but I have worked with all different kinds of Fortune 500 companies. So in addition to the Fortune 500 companies, I work with a lot of companies of different sizes and all different uh, types of work uh, in corporations and also government agencies. One of the things I like about HPT is that it can be practiced in a wide variety of organizations. I like variety. I met someone the other day who was talking to me who does one single kind of thing. It's root cause analysis for the nuclear industry and that's what he does. And I more power to him. I think that's fabulous. For me, I love a variety of things, so I've enjoyed working with retail, with high tech, with the government, with the army, um, many different types of organizations. And I always learn something new when I work with a new type of organization. So I really appreciate that. Um, what I'm working on now, my focus for learning, is really I'm learning through writing. 
I'm writing a series for Performance Improvement Quarterly, our scholarly journal, on myth busting, on different myths that I come across and doing a, a short column where I tackle different myths, a different one every quarter. And this requires me to go out and read quite a lot of the literature to be sure, in fact, well, is this a myth? Where did it come from? If it's not so, why isn't it so? And what might we consider instead? And why do we even care? What difference does this make in our practice? What can we do differently because of it? And so that's the way I am working on staying current. And an HPT term that I'm particularly interested in right now is evidence-based practice. And rather than give a really technical academic -y, uh, type answer for what is evidence-based practice and how would I define it, I'm going to define it as we have something serious that backs this up. It comes from the research. We know because of studies that were made that this is likely to work in such and such a situation. It's not some idea that somebody who might be very smart but who has nothing to back it up made up at their keyboard and published in some journal where they don't really check to see if there's anything behind an idea. And so I'm very interested in this evidence-based practice and I, SPI recentering itself on that area and making sure that we're the society where people come when they want to find things that will really work and it will work in a replicable way in a variety of contexts because we've tested them before. And so, in a nutshell, that's my short story about HPT. Thank you very much.